You're listening to Funny Peculiar with Jeff Downs. Welcome to the second episode of Funny Peculiar, where I chat to acts from the alternative performance worlds, so burlesque, circus, character comedy. This week, I'm chatting to the award-winning magician, Chris Cross. Okay, thanks for uh, listening to Funny Peculiar. Um, this week we've got Chris Cross, the magician, and um, what a CV. He's uh, appeared with the Hairy Bikers, Jay Leno, Mike Tyson, Boba Fett from Star Wars, Darth Vader, uh, the Viz guys. He's performed Harry Houdini tricks, um, performed all around the world. He's also got a Geordie Book of Magic. Hello there, Chris Cross. Good morning. How the devil are you? So yes, good morning. How are you? And where are you at the moment? I've got. Have I got you somewhere on the other side of the planet, or are you back in Newcastle? Just thought I'd really come to you and say good morning. <laughs> <laughs> He's thrown me already. So when we were just talking there a minute ago, and the roster of people you've been with, uh, and Jay Leno, you, uh, you 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 appeared on the Tonight Show down in Vegas. Was that right? It was in it was in Hollywood as part of the studio warm up. That's right. Yeah. And what was and, and you performed tricks and he was there and. I, I performed my contortion act for the studio audience before the the filming of the show started, and he did a little stand up comedy set to warm up with as well. And uh, I forget who was on the on the bill that night. I think Kirk Douglas was on with a few other people. Fantastic, and he was, and you said he was, he was quite amiable, and but you had to get on and do other stuff, and you've met, um, and you've performed with loads of others. But let me take you back when, obviously, you do the circuit as a magician. Is there still a lot of competition between other magicians in the circuit, uh, UK worldwide? Yeah, there's comp- there's competition everywhere. Even McDonald's gets competition by Burger King and people like that. Do you know what I mean? Doesn't matter how how well promoted you are or what you've done or whatever, there's always going to be competition. Um, but am I am I a threat by competition might be a better question. And the answer to that is not really. Um, I, I tend to find the people the people booking me, um, it's a 50-50 split, I would say. Yeah. 60-40, I favour. But the, 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 the split of people is people Googling a magician in the northeast of England, for example, for their wedding or something like that, because they're just looking for a magician to come and do a gig. Yeah. So I'll pop up and they'll contact me and say, Hi, I'm looking for a magician, how much you job, blah, blah, blah. But then the other 50, 60% of the people that say, Hi, Chris, I've seen you before, I know who you are, I want to book Chris Cross. So, you know, and then, and then I'm on to a winner if they want to book Chris Cross, because there isn't another Chris Cross. But if they want to book a magician, that's when competition comes in. But the 50, 60 percent of people that inquire about me usually book me as crisscross, and you know, with those bookings, I don't really have to worry about the the rest of them. Yeah, sure, sure. And then again, you've got that again. Com- comedians do the circuits, but they also have to do the corporate stuff. And you mentioned weddings. So was was there a time when you were booked for a wedding and? They were like expecting because you're kind of an out there character. I've seen you perform, and you do the contortionist. Were they expecting perhaps a bit more of a twee, uh, sleight of hand magician? And you turned up. Were they a bit surprised, or have you had any occasions you where they were all, no? You got it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you have. I'll tell you why. Right. I started out as a magician. I learned my first magic trick when I was just ten years old. And, I, and, and when I was 13, I watched Paul Daniels do a stage show. And when I was 13, that's when I realized that I wanted to do this hobby, this, these magic tricks I've been doing for 50 years. When I was 13 and saw Paul Daniels performing on stage, that's when I realized that I wanted to be like that guy on stage. I wanted to be just like him, and that's what I wanted to do forever for a living. And nothing's changed since. Um, so. I've, I've always wanted to be a magician. When I left school at 16 to, to do it as a full-time job, I was, I'd was i already been working semi-professionally from the age of 13 to 16, but when I left school when I was 16, that's when I realized there was other magicians on the scene. That's when I had problems with competition. Nobody knew who I was. I didn't have a, a, a good sort of list of clients or anything like that at that time. I'd just taken the odd one or two gigs, you know, fitting them in with school. So. 
when I left when I was 16, that's when, when it really hit me that there was other magicians out there working and, and it was competitive. And, and, was, and what, if I could just stop you there, when you were starting off and you watched Paul Daniels and at school, were you then doing trying tricks out on friends? It was. Did you oh, get your confidence? Yeah, that, yeah, I was a little fat bully kid at school when I was 10. But by the time I was 11, I think I was the cool magic man at school. And everyone called us the magic man, and I was quite popular after that. And can you remember the first trick you, you did or performed that got the crowd of kids? Or what was... Do you, can you remember? Yeah. I can, yes. Yeah. It was a point it was called the coin benefit. I bought it from the shop in Newcastle for a magic box. It was £2.49. It was a piece of elastic. And on one side of the bit of elastic was a safety pin, and on the other side was a part of the clip tied to it. And what happened was the, the pin, the inside of your, your jacket, so your coat, um, and pull the elastic down the sleeve and have the crocodile, the crocodile clip between the finger and thumb. So if you borrow a coin off somebody, you hold it between your finger and thumb secretly in a crocodile clip, and then you'd like pretend to put it in your hand, but let go. Yeah. The, and the coin would go with the crocodile clip and the elastic up in the inside of your pocket and in it inside your jacket and it, it would disappear so that was my first trick it was a bit naff really and I actually bought it for 2 and 49 I could have made it myself for about 12 pence but the power that brought you the power was that I take oh, yeah. it that there was that they got up on the reactions and, and is that what it was that what kind of got the fact that you could get a reaction and hold the kids and uh, were the teachers impressed at all or it was like ah he's just learned another trick we I could do that <laughs> nah I think I think if, you know at primary school it was like oh cool yeah he's doing magic hmm. tricks there's made another lad that did pull Martin Shields he did it first I thought he was cool and I could him but uh, he doesn't do it anymore but <clears throat> the teacher at the primary school I think smiled and thought oh isn't that nice but then the teachers at high school, I'm um, a business study teacher was quite good. He actually booked me for a few gigs. But then the majority of the other teachers would come and gave my cards and I had to get them back at the end of the day or the end of the week or whatever. Mind, I wouldn't put the things down. You know, during lesson, I was practicing how to cut a pack of cards with one hand underneath the desk and occasionally dropping them and, um, and stuff like that. But I, I, even my drama teacher at school, who was hopeless, um, Mrs. Well, there was two of them. They were both just as hopeless as one another. One was Convery and one was Mrs. Frank. Right. And they both, um, they both confiscate elastic bands off me every lesson because I'd be sitting there working out magic tricks with elastic bands. And, and their line to me would be, you obviously think you're a very, you, you think you're better than everybody else, but you think you're a very good, you think you're a very good magician, but you obviously think you're very good. You know, and, and I said, well, yeah, 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 you know, I, I, I thought that actually what they said was they didn't say they, they thought they thought I was very good. And they said you obviously think you're a very good actor. Yeah. Don't you? Don't have to listen to us. You obviously think you're a very good actor. My answer to that was the classic line of, um, "Well, I've got everybody in the whole school believing that I'm a magician." But I can't actually make things fly. I can't actually make things float. Yeah. I can't actually read their minds. They're all magic tricks, but I've got the whole school calling me a magician. I'm merely an actor playing the part of a magician. Sure, sure. So in one respect, yeah. During the class, <laughs> and it was, and so, and once you hit sixteen and you're leaving school, were you thinking, well, I could do this full time? This is what I want to do. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it was yeah. more of a reality. I that, yeah, I thought that when I was thirty, and I, I stuck to me guns, and I said, yeah, when I'm sixteen, I'm going to leave school, which I did. Uh, just can't now. I think got to stick with reading. But um, when I was sixteen, I said. So yeah, I'll, I'll stick the guns, I'll leave school as planned, and then I went to set up to be a, a, a full-time magician. That's when I realised there was competition. So I had to change things because there was that many close-up guys, people doing card trips and close-up magic and stuff within the northeast of England that I, I didn't really get a look in. I was calling up hotels, bars, restaurants, and hi there, my name's Chris, I'm a magician. Uh, you know, would you like me to come along to your restaurant every Sunday and perform Sunday dinners? Or would you like would you like me to be the resident magician at your hotel? So if you've got any corporate events, you can recommend me and all that. The, you know, this thing, two or three names kept cropping up uh, when they replied to the corporate unions 
Iska or that guy. Yeah. You know, the same people they were mentioning. And after, you know, a week or two of ringing around people, I, I, I realised that um, yeah, the market was at the time, you know, 12 years ago, the market was quite oversaturated. Um, and there was a lot of guys trying to be magicians. I think it was following the whole David Blaine popularity thing. Did it was that was that quite an impact for the, when David Blaine because he kind of changed things, didn't he? With his yeah, that that yeah. was that an influence for you the way he did yeah, stuff yeah. and is it Dynamo as well? Is it, he did uh, he he's a he's a similar David Blaine magician, isn't he? David Blaine did proper tricks. Um, the the thing is, Paul Daniels was was the coolest magician for a long time the longest ever running he had the longest ever running magic show you know on the, on the television um and paul daniels was britain's um britain's sort of you know example of a magician you know you think of magic you think of paul daniels and then unfortunately paul's kind of um paul's um, generation of, of entertainers started to dwindle, you know, you've got um, Paul Daniels and Jimmy Cricket and people like that, they're all fantastic entertainers and I prefer the people around today but, but you know, the, the kind of um, work and men's club era entertainment was coming to a bit of an end, unfortunately because yeah, there was some great acts and this David Blaine guy took the world by storm, you know, he, he was one guy, he didn't have a, a magic rabbit, he didn't have a magic hat, he didn't have a magician's assistant, you know, everything that Paul Daniels was, he wasn't. And, and he, he sort of um, took the magic world, the, 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 the general public by storm, he just kind of got them and gave them a bit of a shake, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Guy not he's just he's dressed all in black, no branded clothes, no sequins, no sparkle, no and any any and you perform magic trick, not with you know, um, pretty painted boxes, not with silk handkerchiefs, but with but with cigarettes, with coins, with cards, with lighters, you know, with, with real everyday objects. And everyone in Britain was so used to magicians performing tricks with magic looking objects dressed in a magic kind of way and then Blaine comes along and takes with normal stuff looking totally normal and he's performed normal people on a normal video camera there was nothing showbiz or razzle dazzle about it and because of because of it being so real you know and so gritty almost it, it, it really captivated people and got people really interested in magic after it had gone a little bit, after it got a little bit tired he kind of put shake in the back on it and made it made it trendy again and this and because it was so up close I mean it was street magic it was kind of termed at uh, termed as going a, the Bronx, Bronx you know he's going to the Bronx and places like yeah. that with one other guy and a compelled shaky video camera entertaining people that you know like could have shot them um it you know it wasn't a, a safe warm studio audience in media city or somewhere you know it was uh it was real you know and and, and did your act change once you saw david blaine did you did it influence you in any way or it was just well that's his style i'll carry on doing my thing well, David Blaine was from when I, I, I'd kind of seen David. I, my friend at school who, who got me in the mind was influenced already by David Blaine. So me and my friend were doing David Blaine-esque tricks to start with. And then when I went to see Paul Daniels when I was 13, that's when I started doing a bit more showmanship and my performance because that's what Paul was all about, putting comedy in, putting stories in David Blaine just stared people out and said <laughs> well I think there was that famous interview with Eamon Holmes wasn't there on TV yeah. and he just yeah. just couldn't get and Damon Holmes didn't know what to make that was that was very much his persona wasn't it yeah yeah he was I think he was doing a bit of there he had that eye tool on the hand. oh that's <laughs> right yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, but I prefer the old school 
type of magicians as opposed to the new school. Yeah. David Blaine was good. What he did was different. And it got the world reinterested in magic. Yes. Now, give me Paul Daniel the Dynamo any day, but fair play the Dynamo because he's making a living and he's on the you know, he's on the sticker on Coca Cola bottles. I mean shit, that's pretty good, you know, that's massive, that's beyond saving. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, oh, he's 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 got massive now, Dynamo, hasn't he? That's, I mean, he's taken that to arenas now, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, an arena magic show, fantastic. You know, it really is great what he's what he's done for himself, what he's doing for the art. Um, you think people like so, so, so Dynamo was kind of like uh, Dynamo was kind of like a refreshed version of David Blaine, but David Blaine was kind of like the refreshed version of magic. Yeah. You know, David Blaine didn't follow anybody. David Blaine didn't. David Blaine isn't like a version of somebody else. I would say Dynamo is like a, like a version of David Blaine, that kind of style of magic. But David Blaine invented that kind of magic. And, you know. And uh, sorry, to, just, just to say as well, but you've got stuff coming up as well. Like I was, uh, you've got, you'll be at the Tyne Theatre and Opera House. Is it later in the year? Um, yeah, you've got a, uh, which, which is now that's that's a massive auditorium, that's a massive theatre, with Dynamo now doing these big uh, arenas. But you're doing massive shows as well. So I take it there's no there's no um, limit to how big you can perform magic in an arena. When you come to perform to so many people, how how do you then, if you're doing close up magic or how do you then, you know, telegraph that out to everybody? Do you have to be bigger? Do you have to be better in your tricks or your stunts? No, no not necessarily. Um there's um so the Time Theatre, that's eleven hundred capacity theatre and now I could do card tricks on that stage. Dynamo could do card tricks on his arena tour. All you need is a video camera on you and you've got the big screens to project on. And that's not an issue. It's a bit like saying um you know, Paloma Faith is doing a tour and she's on the main stage of Glastonbury. Do do, do you think she needs to like you know, like 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 um do something to to make her a bit bigger. Sure, to, yeah. You know, it, it, not really, she's saying, you want to hear her. So if you're doing magic tricks, everybody can hear you. Yeah. Our microphones are probably the same as hers. Um, and and it's, it, it's just as long as... Lo- it's, hmm. Let me say, let me say, let me say, let me say um, no, that, that, that's, that's the question is no, it doesn't have to be bigger. Sure. It could be bigger. Yeah. So you could big flashy props. You could you on the you could well make the most of of a stage and a big audience if you if you're lucky enough to have one. And and you might as well use all of the big flashy fancy props. Yeah. Because you can't do it in the middle of the street. Sure. Well it's card tricks you can do in the middle of the street or in the middle of the pub or in the middle of the schoolyard or whatever. So if I was on a big style of stage then I guess I would put on a huge show. I would do the upside down straight jacket escape. I would do big massive illusions where boxes catch fire and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I would take full advantage of it. But, but, but again, to answer the question, no, you don't need to make everything bigger and better. You could just do the same card tricks with a video camera on your hands projected onto the big print and people would love it just as much. Yeah. Because it was still everything. As long as everybody can see it. And as long as everybody can hear it. It doesn't really matter what you do. It comes to the group. And um, and can I and also with a lot of magicians there is the there's the magician circle there's the secrecy sort of act or you know there's that uh, camaraderie between magicians you don't reveal your secrets uh, and I just wondered what you thought because Penn and Teller did that sort of famous television show where how many ever years ago now and they exposed a lot of this is how it's done so. Do we, we, Normal people watching didn't really get the methods because they were saying in technical terms what, what magicians understand, whilst the average lay person is sitting there having his take. Yeah. That I think watching the show wouldn't have a bloody clue what they were talking about and they would just enjoy it for the magic. Yeah. I think food was a great program, you know, because you had. The thing with television magic now is in the days of Paul Daniels, which was. 
you know, you had you had your Tommy Cooper and Abby Bongo and David Nix and all that, and then Paul Daniels. They would do proper the sort of tricks that anybody could do with practice. You know, yeah. you perform the trick with practice, not present it with practice as well as Paul Daniels and stuff, because he was a genius with the showmanship and things. But these were tricks that a kid could go into a magic shop. Uh, walk in say, this is the trick that I want I saw it on the board and I wanted to show the guy behind the counter would sell them that trick and that kid could go away and within X amount of time depending on the trick and look how they did the trick right yeah so we used to have proper magic tricks on the telly on Fool Us all of the magicians on the show performed proper magic tricks which is great but these modern day magicians you know people that you see on the TV nowadays with the exception of a little show mm. and a few other um, generally speaking the magicians you see now sadly um, are using a lot of stooges a lot of camera tricks a lot of bullshit which is such a shame you know when when I go to a gig and I perform a card trick a normal card trick people say oh well that's that's a bit Good, but you know it's not that great. I mean, can you walk up the side of a building? Or can you walk on water? Yeah, right. The <laughs> magician on the TV doing that. Yeah. So you know, well, if you give me a million pounds, six cameras, and fifty people to pose as an audience, sure I can. So you know it, I mean? yeah, absolutely. They so they 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 they're seeing this stuff on television. They want more. They want bigger. And really, the. Yeah, but, it's impossible to do this shit in real life. Yeah. Modern magic show, in some respects, is oil magic. It's but then you know, magic even bigger, even better, elevated it to the next level. So if it wasn't for people like Dynamo and stuff on the television nowadays, then I wouldn't be getting anywhere near as many gigs as what I get. Yeah, sure. Now, the more these TV magic shows are on and all that, great. Anything that promotes the art of magic, fantastic. The more the more people are into magic, the more people want a magician in their events. The more people want a magician in their event, the more work I get, the more money I make, the better lifestyle I have, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm all for anything to do with magic on the TV and all that. But I am saying that the shame when I go to the game. Patrick, so you, you just and so you just, and you're like, well, yeah, that's what most of us magicians do, you know? Yeah. It's, you know, it's a point, because tricks are good. It's only rarely people are calling me on it and say, oh, well, did you want to like, you know, can you, can you walk through that wall? Can you, you know, walk on that sure. pond over there? But, but the, what I say to people that actually do things like that is I, is I say, well, I can't, you know, they give me a million pounds in television cameras and an audience that I, I can and then, and then I said, I'll give you an example of modern day television and magic shows of television. The other day I was watching the TV, okay, and a guy, a normal bloke, right, a bloke watching normal, was standing in the middle of Times Square in New York City, and he started a group, and he noticeably, and then his body and skin turned green. Yeah. And then he picked up a yellow taxi cab and he threw it across Times Square. How did he do it? He was called the Hulk or something, the Incredible Hulk. How did he do it? It must be magic. Yeah. And they say, well, that was a film. You know, that's the Incredible Hulk. That was just on television. That's how he does it. It's special effects and stuff. It's just a film. Yeah. And I say, oh, well, when you watch Dynamo and people like that on the TV, that's just on the television. And then they say, yeah, but there's real people there and blah, blah, blah. There's witnesses watching his magic tricks. And I say, well, there was loads of people in Times Square. There was thousands of people from all over the world. And they all saw the incredible public people in the back seat and throws. How is that not real? It's crazy. <laughs> it's it? crazy. All I'm saying is television magic used to be proper musicians doing proper tricks. Yeah. And now game because magic's gone in a completely different direction and probably over half on television is bullshit yeah sure uh, that's yeah I think that's sometimes the way it goes isn't it with with a lot of the different acts that non stand up in all the different guises of all the different acts out there um, and what would you say as well to anybody that might be listening that thinks hey I want to get into magic I want to 
give it a try what best routes advice. are in what, what's the best advice best advice that I could possibly give would be to go to www.chris-cross.co.uk click on the shop page <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, yeah, it does not these theme magic tricks along with the DVD of course all the 12 pounds and the oven gloves duvet cover it's all on there so they can <laughs> they can get brilliant and you have you bought when when did the book come out was that last year last year brilliant oh, yeah. fantastic and um, that's brilliant and um, uh, and what do your family think as well when you were going from, you were starting at school all those years ago and then you were sort of getting better and they were like, oh, hang on, this, this, he could do this. Was we, we, Have your family always been supportive or? Yeah, it was great for me because I was brought up by my grandparents. So okay. I said to my grandparents, I'm off at a thumping nightclub in the middle of the Boston City Centre to do some magic tricks when I was 13. They were like, no problem. <laughs> in the nightclub back in the day was like a tea dance so it was it was ideal to me but they were very supportive always have been brilliant fantastic and one final question chris if i may ask um for the series for funny peculiar who would you recommend i interview and why who would be good for this podcast um i think sam wills would be good okay um i said well, because you can't interview the boy, the boy was tape on his face because he's a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I could use Morse code. Uh, Gamma Jabat, then that's another mind map. Okay. He's Japanese, he's English, and they're a really good, a really good mind duo. I would recommend. Um, I think I might have seen them in Edinburgh one year doing a... The two Japanese guys, aren't they? And they did going down an escalator and coming up. They did a yeah. chase. Is that them? They're great. They're yeah. incredible. Okay. Um, uh, what about what about some old school guys? Yeah. Well, what about people like Jimmy Cricket? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'm, I'll do that then. Let me see. Uh, I... I can I'll try and get hold of Jimmy Cricket. Listen, Chris, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate yeah. it. Good luck. Marcel as well. Alexis with Marcel Lucon. He does a the really good French character act, I think. Fantastic. I will I tell you what. I'm gonna have to, I think I'm gonna to have to email you and get all these listed down. These because I'm, I'm like I'm furiously writing here. I don't think I can keep up. This uh, this could keep me going. Say again. It's getting recorded. You've got to wait. Well, there you go. I just listened back to my own podcast. You have given me a great idea. <laughs> this is just one di- giant dictaphone message, anyway. Technically, isn't it? What is a podcast? So uh, I did podcast in New York when I was driving in the car on long distances. They were just getting me on stuff and record random things that were coming up ahead and get home. Uh, and have you done that? I sometimes you can do that. And you remember, have you ever then recorded something uh, middle of the night and then you listen to it the next day and you think, what the fuck was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Numerous times. Uh, what I what I did before that is I'd wake up in the middle of the night, pen and paper next to my bed and write stuff down. What was worse than waking up in the morning and listening back to yourself? Because what the hell was I talking? <laughs> I don't know. It just doesn't make sense, does it? That's brilliant. It is. It's difficult. Brilliant. Chris, yeah. uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, appreciate yeah. your time. And I'm sure once I get this going, I'll get you back on. And then we'll, we'll, t- we'll talk some more. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chris Cross. Thank you. Thanks. You've been listening to Funny Peculiar. Tune in next week. More great guests. Thanks again to Chris Cross for joining me on Funny Peculiar Podcast. If you want to follow Chris, you can on Twitter at the Chris Cross. His website, www.chris-cross.co.uk or his Instagram account, which is Chris Cross Official. Or there's loads of clips on YouTube. Keep following Funny Peculiar. We've got more great guests coming up. And please subscribe to the show. So see you next week.